Hey everyone, my name is Pete Croft. I'm the ER doc at Maine Medical Center and help run the ultrasound program here. I wanted to put something together for you all that are coming to the winter symposium up at Sugarloaf in March to kind of give you a, a preface to what we're going to be doing hands-on throughout that day. We have a two-hour session and I didn't want to lecture throughout that session so put together this primer to go over the major modalities, each element of the, um, the modalities and to try to highlight um, some of the features that you should pay particular attention to and that will make your life easier come uh, March 3rd when we end up scanning. I'm going to break this up into four smaller videos of each segment so that you can watch it in an easier fashion. Uh, the instructors for the day, myself, Tony and Chris, who you may have met before, who I work with, Scott Glazier, who I did fellowship with, um, down in Boston, who works, he works in Lawrence now, Laurel Parker, who's up at Maine General, and Christina Wilson, who's a new hire here at Maine Medical Center, who will be starting in June and July. So what are our goals for the day? First, we're going to be talking about echocardiography. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about the EFAST exam, which includes uh, looking for pneumothorax along with free fluid in the belly and in the thorax. We'll be looking at high-yield nerves both in the upper and lower extremities. And then lastly, we'll cover DVT and look at the major features of that. So let's start um, with echo. It's probably the most cumbersome and trying ultrasound modality to learn, but probably the most sense or, or the most satisfying once you do get to that point where you become facile with it. Here's a, a quick or a, a quick rubric of actually Ben Franklin's daily routine. I, I think my dad gave me this when I was younger, and I always think about this when I think of getting into a routine of doing anything. It's a quite enviable routine, morning, noon, afternoon, evening, and night, the way he breaks it up. Kind of an idyllic world, which is an ER doctor. We can't really work in these beautiful time frames and cyclic daylight, day and night patterns, but... Um, the same goes true with echo, and the way I try to approach doing an echocardiogram at the bedside, it's, again, it's a really tricky exam to learn, so I think being really systematic about it is important. The first thing you want to do is, is obtain what's called a long axis view. And you can see in this picture, the probe is sliding down the sternum. It's called the parasternal long view. This is your cardiac phased array probe. You see the P21, and you notice how the the probe is pointed to the left hip. The probe marker is actually right here on this side of the probe, so it's pointed to the left hip. Long is left. The other thing you want to notice is how he, the operator, which is me in this case, is just sliding right down next to the sternum. This enables you to look between each rib space and will negate all that time you fuddle and mutz around looking for that perfect window. This makes it nice and system systematic and I guarantee one, one of these rib spaces you'll get a view, which may not be optimal, but it will be a good view that you can then tweak and make very small, subtle movements. So I suggest starting way up high, you see right underneath the clavicle, and just coming straight down the sternum, keeping that pro marker always directed at the left hip. That's the key. What kind of image are you going to get when you perform this? So again, left hip, long, is left. What kind of image are you going to get? This is the image you'll generate. Notice again here, this is going to be your left ventricle. Remember that indicator is to the left hip. So it's actually, this part of the image actually corresponds to this side of the probe, if that makes any sense. So it's, the heart is sitting right here in the upper thorax. The apex, or the PMI, the point of maximal impulse of the heart, is actually down here. And that's what you're looking at here. So this is your left ventricle forming your left ventricular outflow tract here, aortic valve, and then your left atrium, and this is your mitral valve. Notice the mitral valve flapping and almost touching the septum, more of which we'll talk about later. This is a nice one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio in this long axis view. You can also notice this descending thoracic aorta down here. Some of these things we'll, we'll talk about as we go along. But again, this left, le this probe is aimed right at the left hip, and this is the image you're going to be generating.
Next, again, be system, uh, systematic about it. It's a really hard word for me to say today. Um, move from the left hip to the right hip with your probe. So that, notice that probe marker here is twisting 90 degrees to that right hip. Here you go, twisting around. And it, you don't even have to do much at all. You don't even move the probe off kind of where it's anchored on the chest when you get this view. And this is the view you're going to be getting. Again, you're moving from that long axis view here to this short axis view here. And you're cutting right through that ventricle in that short axis view. So this is all LV here, right along the mitral valve in this scenario. Again, just a 90 degree turn to the right clockwise. Once you get in that view, that short axis view, this pro marker aiming to the right, you can rock back and forth. What this enables you to do is move from the base all the way to the apex of the heart. The base of the heart, counterintuitively for me, is actually you know the top of the heart or the most cephalad of the heart portion of the heart. So it includes kind of the apical, or I'm sorry, the aortic root, uh, which you're seeing right at the beginning here. It's called the Mercedes Benz sign, um, and then you're fanning all the way down towards the, the PMI or the apex of the heart going through the mitral valve, which you catch right there. This side right here is actually a right ventricular outflow tract. Again, this is kind of more advanced stuff. I just want you to get a, an idea of just being um, nice and routine with your echo, with your echo. so you're getting the long axis first and then going over to your short axis view. And again, kind of in a clockwise fashion, you went from the left hip to the right hip. Next view you're gonna be getting is your apical view. So you're just aiming the probe at the right hip. To get this next view, all you essentially do, and you'll see in a moment how you do that, is move your probe kind of underneath the nipple and then just aim it to the right flank. So again, moving in a clockwise fashion. This is the image you're gonna generate. It kind of looks like a four square game, your left ventricle is on the right side of your screen, the right ventricles on the left. Notice how the left ventricle should be in a normal heart bigger than the right ventricle. Again, this is what you're gonna be doing. So you're gonna move underneath that nipple. In this case, the operator going from a long axis um, to a apical view, you can either do that or again, go from the short axis, but you're going from, in this case, the left hip all the way over, pointing that probe to the right flank. And on the bottom left of your screen, there's your image you're going to generate. Notice this left ventricle, much bigger than your right ventricle. There are both of your valves in view. And there's your indicator aiming to the right side of the patient. This view is imperative and important when you're looking at right ventricular activity and size. Lastly, sub xiphoid view. You guys have probably done this with your FAST exams. Again, your pro marker is faced to the right, so you don't have to really move that. In this case, the patient, the operator is using a um, curvilinear probe. This can be used. You can still use the phased array probe. Either one is fine. Notice that the thing I'll say here is the operator is pushing straight down on the belly. Notice how it's almost parallel to the, to the stretcher and to the cot. You're actually looking way up into the chest here, right? So you're looking all the way up into the heart to see if um, or um, all the way up into the chest to see if you can grasp a heart. The, the major issue people usually have is pointing the probe more too perpendicular and not capturing that pericardial window. So again, pushing right down into that sub xiphoid, aiming that probe almost parallel to the bed. And on the left side of the screen, here's your image that you're going to generate, pushing down into that uh, patient. You can have them sometimes take a deep breath. That'll bring the heart down towards your probe occasionally. You can flatten it, as we mentioned, and pressure, pressure. Same with doing aorta scans, which we won't talk about today. Pressure is going to be your friend. So there are three E's in echocardiography that are important in an emergency setting, one of them being ejection fraction, uh, the other two being enlargement or right ventricular enlargement, and the last one being effusion. So the three E's are what we'll focus on during this hands-on session in March. So the ejection fraction we're discussing here is your left ventricle. Uh, I bring these up because it's important you'll see this in the literature, but there's objective analyses of ejection fraction, which I tend to favor and do in the ER in a clinical setting when time is of the essence. And there's an objective analysis, which you'll see measurements on formal echoes. And I'll, I just want to give you a quick uh, comment on 
uh, objective analysis as well. So right off the bat, having to, if you've never seen an echo before, again, what view are we in? We're in the short axis view, right? So we're in that parastornal short. We're aiming the probe to the right hip, and you're cutting right through this left ventricle. On the left side here, would you say that's normal or abnormal? Probably normal, right? So the cavity of the left ventricle is shutting down almost 50%, I'd say, at least. And then on the right here, you don't have to be a echo tech or to echo school um, to know that that's an abnormal ejection fraction globally down in its ejection fraction all the way across that wall. You're looking for that concentric squeeze, that symmetric squeeze. Again, another view, this is your long axis view, just an objective, I'm sorry, just a subjective analysis here, just looking at the patient, looking at the echo without doing any measurements on the left. Notice how this mitral valve, which we discussed before, is coming over and almost slapping the septum. That's the first place my eye looks when I do one of these long axis views. If this mitral valve is coming close to hitting the septum, you know that your ejection fraction is good. The blood that was in the left ventricle by default, since this valve came all the way up, has fully evacuated and come up through the aortic outflow tract. Whereas in this case, on the right, notice this valve is barely even moving, meaning that all this blood is not moving out. It's just stagnating in here, and that ejection fraction is going to be uh, much less. On an objective standpoint, essentially looking at that exact thing, but just gives us a numerical value to attribute to it. So what is it? It's called E-point septal separation, EPSS. So essentially it's using M-mode, which you've used for a pneumothorax before, placing it right over that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And you notice how this valve is coming up and almost smacking the septum. So when you use M-mode, M-mode stands for motion mode. It's essentially every dot or every speck along this linear line is going to be transposed in a um, in a time sensitive or in a time uh, manner in the next image, which is going to be along the x axis. So again, every speck along this line is or along this line is represented on the this image below is a representation of time as a function of time. So these little shark tooth or I'm sorry, uh, shark fin spikes here represent the movement of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. You can see how they quickly goes up towards the septum, which is this bright white line here, this bright white line here. Notice it's probably about um, seven or eight centimeters down here, and again, seven or eight centimeters here. Notice the distance between this is what's going to be your EPSS. Normal is very small, again, almost hitting the septum. If it's large, greater than 18 millimeters or almost two, <coughs> or almost 20 uh, millimeters, and your ejection fraction is going to be likewise much diminished. Let's hope that makes sense. Again, subjective, just an eyeball approach is going to give you your answer most of the time. So again, what's your EPSS on the left? Probably going to be really small and diminutive on the right, larger. You don't need any objective measurements to really determine that. <coughs> Next off, enlargement. So. This is what we're looking, we're talking about in terms of right ventricle. That right ventricle, when it's enlarged, is is typically a result of either an acute or a chronic process. It's in, it's you, up to you as the ED doctor to determine whether that's acute or if it's a chronic thing. If they've had COPD or um, pulmonary hypertension for years, but if you can identify right ventricular enlargement on your bedside echo, it can really help guide your therapy, uh, especially in a very sick critically ill patient. So how do we do this? Again, this, this is going to be both subjective and objectively. Typically in the ED setting, when I'm, when I'm uh, taking care of patients quickly and having making decisions quickly, I, this is something that I do just subjectively. Um, but we'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a, an objective analysis as well to keep you um, in line with what you'll, you might read on ECHO reports. So again, I mentioned earlier that apical four chamber view is going to be your money view for this. So that pro marker is aimed toward the right flank. Right flank. There's your pro marker coming over to the right flank. 
this is the image you're going to generate. Again, just globally looking at this pictorial, which is normal, which is abnormal. Here's your pro marker here, so you know that the right it's aimed at the right flank, so your corresponding ventricle is going to be your right ventricle. This is easily smaller than the left ventricle. On this case, however, notice how big this right ventricle is and how small and diminutive this left ventricle is, almost triangular. So this patient has right ventricular enlargement. Again, up to you to decide whether this is acute or chronic, depending on the situation. Much bigger and smaller. Short axis view. Another nice view, I, I, ne I never use this by itself to determine right ventricular enlargement because it's usually never this pretty. But you notice on the left here, you have a normal LV concentric squeeze. Looks like the letter O on the right, it looks like the letter D. The reason for that is that compression of that right ventricle is really overpowering the septum and pushing down into the left ventricle. It also looks like this patient on the right might have a small effusion as well. I'd want to see more images, but you can see a bit on the top as well on the bottom. It's called the D sign. Again, acute or chronic, up to you to decide. Much like the EPSS with left ventricular ejection fraction and that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, the objective measure of right ventricular enlargement is something called the TAPSI, or tricuspid annular systolic plane excursion, something I had never heard about before doing a fellowship. And again, I don't care if you ever remember this, um, it just helps, it does help put the pieces together when you think about acute, or, or I'm sorry, when you think about um, right ventricular enlargement and just subjectively looking at it. So what is it? How do I find it? Tapsy is going to be that free wall, the tricuspid annular systolic plane. So that free wall, the tricuspid valve is here on the right, is how well it's excurting or, or moving with systole. So every systolic movement, you can see that it looks like it's jumping on a trampoline here. This is normal. You expect that to happen. This right ventricle is devoid of any high pressure system or process going on. So when that M mode is placed over that free wall of the, the valve, notice this beautiful, almost wave-like pattern that develops. This distance of the excurting plane of the, the mitral valve, or the movement of the mitral valve here, I'm sorry, the tricuspid valve, the free wall, is, is something called the TAPSI. Um, if this goes beyond 15 millimeters, that's going to be a normal finding. So a nice, free, easy movement of that right ventricular wall. This is contrasted to something like this, where again, notice right away, right ventricle is bigger than left ventricle. And focus your attention on that free wall or that tricuspid plane on the left side here of your screen. Notice how there's really a stunted movement of that. And you're not certainly not moving 15 millimeters. Um, you could certainly measure it, but in an acute situation, um, I think an eyeball view uh, gives you plenty of information. Last off is effusion. So determining whether there's effusion fluid around the heart or fluid in the lungs, that's basically going to be your, your, the crux of what you're, you're going to learn here. Here on the left, there's fluid in the chest. You're going to know in a second if it's in the lungs or the heart. The key to knowing is looking at this descending aorta, so that circular anechoic structure right behind the heart. Again, we're in a long axis view. Notice the black anechoic space to the left of the descending over aorta over here. Notice how there's no fluid tracking in front of that. The pericardium actually will tether into this aorta. So if there's fluid outside, outside of the pericardium, you will not see it cross in front of the aorta. So this is actually a pleural fluid. This is a post on the right here. You notice how the fluid tracks in front of this aorta. Notice the pericardium back here tethers into the aorta. There's fluid in the pericardial sac, so it moves in front of the aorta. 
So this landmark becomes very important when differentiating the two. Notice in front and behind blue pericardial, yellow is going to be your pleural effusions. This is often a chest x-ray you'll get knowing no idea where there's fluid. There's certainly fluid on the right side of the chest. On the left side of the chest, who knows whether it's in the lungs or around the heart. So in a sick patient, a quick echo can give you a ton of information. Right off the bat, fluid in the heart or in the lungs. This isn't a long axis view. This is likely a sub xiphoid view. You can actually see the liver up here. So this is, this is a patient with fluid all around the heart. So this is a very large pericardial effusion with what appears to be some right ventricular and right side, right heart um, pressure strain. You can see this right atrium being pushed down, this right ventricle is working certainly hard. So in the right situation, this could be some tamponade. Likewise, this is a long axis view. Here's your atrium, your outflow tract here, left ventricle outflow tract. Notice how there's an effusion down here. It's not necessarily monstrous, but it does track in front of this descending aorta. And notice this right ventricle here at the top of your flame, at the top of your video. Notice that thing jumping up and down like someone's on a, um, it's like someone's on a uh, trampoline. That movement up and down suggests a sonographic tamponade. Now the patient might not be in vital sign tamponade yet, but if you see this, I would be nervous that they may be moving in that direction quicker rather than slower. It might. Uh, it has certainly changed my management of patients and will yours if you start noticing this. Here's an apical four representation of a large pericardial effusion with tamponade. Notice the right atrium just completely collapsing. It's actually a lower system, lower pressure system than the right ventricle, so it will collapse earlier than the right ventricle and will be your most um, most accurate indicator of tamponade. <coughs> So this is again another picture of a, another chest x-ray. Yeah, your video is not coming up unfortunately. But 